Our final speaker has a passion for providing sustainable health care in developing countries and is the founder of the charitable organization Doctors for, Doc for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Please welcome Dr. Andrew Wilson. Hi everyone. Uh, so I guess my journey actually begins when I started first year here at CMCC. I had uh, I actually just got back from a trip to Nicaragua at the time, did some great surfing down there, if you've been. And uh, I was also really lucky in that I ended up meeting a, um, a young person who wanted to step up in a small community that had not a lot of healthcare at the time. And they wanted to step up and become a leader in that community uh, and give healthcare in a sustainable way for the rest of their lives. They wanted to go to medical school in Nicaragua and then return back to their community. And I got back after meeting her and I started first year CMCC, and I thought, you know, start an international development project while well, I'm in first year at CMCC. What the hell could go wrong, right? Uh, so uh, that's kind of how it all started, and that's how my interest in international development started as well. And uh, I actually remember one day uh, in specific, I was sitting in second year physiology, and uh, Dr. Brian Budgel came to the front of the class and he started to give a lecture in just a ridiculously fluorescent and textile Tanzanian sweater uh, that I could tell was clearly handcrafted. And uh, I approached him after the class and we started talking about our experiences in international development, um, what worked in rural communities and, and what didn't work. And our values ended up connecting so much that uh, after fourth year, when I graduated, I flew with him to Tanzania for three months down there. Um, I worked as a chiropractor in a multidisciplinary, uh, tiny healthcare clinic in a small community. Uh, and then I brought back to, uh, or went back to Botswana for three months as well, uh, and, world, and worked with World Spine Care down there. And then uh, something else happened where I ended up transitioning, and I ended up coming back to Toronto to really take all of that knowledge that I was fortunate enough to accumulate and to try to put that into practice. And I started really putting a lot of energy and roots into Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses and growing it into what it is today, which we're starting to sponsor more and more medical students and it's now a registered charity that just happened. So uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about a concept uh, that we all swear on um, and it's a concept that has always fascinated me. Um, and I remember when I was in fourth year when we graduated, uh, we kind of said the, the chiropractic oath, and I know every healthcare profession has its own version of that. And uh, it's the concept of do no harm, this idea that we want to work as hard as we can to serve the, the people that we really care about. And for me, at the time, uh, I was able to explore that um, upon reflection of just a couple of stories that I have that I wanted to share with you today. So the first story, I guess, when you really think about it, when you want to reduce the amount of harm that you do in the world, uh, you need to understand when you're at an increased risk for causing that harm in the first place. So when you're in a position of power. And for me, uh, as soon as I got to Tanzania, one of my first patients came in. And uh, I remember him sitting down, and he was wearing a, a, a very kind of fluorescent collared shirt. He was very, very humble. Uh, we had a, a good connection almost right away. And he sat down beside me. And I had Dr. Lupande, a medical doctor, working with me at the time sitting and just acting as a bit of a translator uh, in that. And I did what any of us are training to do, right? I, I started asking him about his pain and try to find out exactly how I could help him in the best way that I could. And uh, he starts talking to me about his pain that he's had for 15 years. And I said, well, where, where is that pain? What's going on? And he points to his left L2 right on the side of his back. And I said, well, how did that happen? Like, how do you have pain in one spot for 15 years without any release of it? And he begins to tell me this story that in his community at the time, there was a young man who was stealing from this older woman. And this, this thief kept on stealing from this older woman in the community, and there's not a lot of police around. So him and a group of other members from that community approached that thief and uh, started to talk to him and, and basically said, listen, you're not welcome back here. You're, you're banished from this community. You're kind of forbidden to come back. And if you do come back, we, we have to seriously hurt you. We have to protect our, our community. And so the young man, the thief, leaves for quite some time. After a while, he comes back. And uh, he starts stealing from the older woman again. And my patient, uh, doing what he kind of promised what he was going to do, gathers up an, a few members of his community, this time with 
um, some farming equipment, some wooden sticks with different shapes of metal on the end. And they approach, they approach this young man who's stealing from the older woman. And I guess everything started to escalate really quickly, right? So the young man got very scared, and he swings and he hits my patient with a shovel right in the back at L2 on the left side. Really quickly, my patient takes a rake up and over and hits him in the head, and it ends up killing him. And a number of other people from the group started hitting the man at the time, but he was already dead. And that's where I'm sitting in, the, in a position of power, listening to this story, realizing that I have no idea about this man's culture or his perspectives. And I'm just thinking back, like, how the hell do I take a low doctor for care on this? Uh, <laughs> how, how, does this, how does this fit into this tiny box, right? How does this fit into this tiny box that our institutions taught us about? Um, because I think institutions, they, they do what they're trained to do. They're really good at reducing the harm that we do on that one-to-one -one level. Um, but these cultural or social levels, they're so complex and they're so unique and specific that it's almost impossible to cover all of them. So that was when I realized that my potential to do harm here was really high. And instead of trying to teach or instead of trying to coach maybe some of the psychology behind it or um, you know, some of the cultural understandings behind it to help mitigate his pain, what I ended up doing was focusing, kind of narrowing my mindset into just what I knew worked from chiropractic college and referring that patient out uh, to professional local services as well. So when you're outside of your context, definitely ask for, for local help. Um, but then there's another time when I started realizing in Tanzania that I was accidentally doing presence just with, uh, accidentally doing harm just with my presence. And so um, for me at the time, just being a white guy driving around in a big truck in a lot of these cities, uh, I found out it was actually causing quite a bit of harm. And it was causing harm because Locals have different understandings of how that, that money, whether it was uh, charity money or government money, should have been spent. And if they don't see the impact directly, they, they really do question it, and it does cause harm in that way. But a more uh, patient-relevant or a more clinically relevant story was I was sitting back in my clinic, and uh, a patient walks in with a large lump in his neck. Now, uh, throw a question to clinicians or to doctors or interns. Has anyone seen a patient with a goiter, like a larger goiter? Uh, I'm not going to count YouTube or, or anything like that, but a real live goiter. They're, they're very distinguished. And uh, I mean, there's a couple of things that it could be, but given that he had no other symptoms at the time, he walked in with uh, what I saw, and, and based on the, the cultural area at the time, what I saw is most probably a goiter. And he walks in and he says, hey, I just came all the way from my tiny community. I'm here to see the doctor. I'm here to see you. And I said, well, that's fantastic. Uh, you're definitely in the right little clinic, but you're just in the wrong office. My specialty is the nervous system. It's it's the muscles, it's the joints, that's what I, I really look at here. I can help diagnose it, but I, I can't really help treat it. Actually, there's a medical officer right next door, a local medical professional uh, that has grown up in this community. She'll, she'll be happy to help you, no worries. And he, he interrupts me and he says, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm not here to see her. I walked all the way from my community to see you. I walked all the way here to see the white doctor. And that's when I got that really gross feeling inside of my, uh, my stomach kind of that hunch that something really wasn't right about this. And I sat with that for a while, and at first I really struggled with it. Uh, I kind of ran away from it for a while, and then I started to own that discomfort and ask questions around, you know, here's this thing that's clearly a cause of harm, and how am I influencing that? I started to ask myself questions of, you know, am I a part of this system? Why would he have said that? Uh, how can I stop this? Then I started asking other people the same questions. How are you a part of this system? Here's this really crazy scenario that happened. Has that ever happened before? I started asking the, the medical doctor that I worked with beside me. I started asking government officials that I was working with, other patients, the man with the goiter himself. Um, and essentially, we, we, I started to understand how they all influenced that as well. And how I think we're so focused on that doctor-patient interaction, on that one-on-one -on -one interaction, that we, we kind of blind ourselves and we miss these, these bigger causes of harm that we can have, right? These, these social or, or cultural harms. We forget to prop up local healthcare systems whenever we can because we're so focused on that doctor-patient interaction. And then we started to come up with a solution. And the solution came from a number of different people and, and worked on a, a number of different levels. And it was, uh, I was just in the clinic at the time and during my assessments and my diagnoses and even some of my treatments, I was just to involve the local medical professionals as much as possible and in front of patients let them see that their opinion was just as valid as mine. And I hope, I mean, there's no research on it, but I do hope that 
over time that that helps to break down that, that false understanding or that barrier um, that's, that was created. Now, another scenario where I found out I was doing harm again uh, was not necessarily in the local context like the last story, but it was actually abroad. It was uh, harm that I was doing back in here, even back in CMCC or back in Toronto. And I was working with an organization at the time that just tasked me with a very simple thing. They wanted me to send photos of what I was doing, of the chiropractic work that I was doing uh, in an interdisciplinary hospital uh, back to them so they could use them for, for fundraising and, uh, and advertising. And I did actually, I was just kind of fortunate. I was partnered with a physiotherapist at the time who was also a professional photographer. And I thought, well, if anyone can make me look good, it's probably her. So I, I took pictures of what the situation authentically was. Uh, and it was me in a collared shirt treating patients in collared shirts in a brand newly built, uh, in a brand, brand new built building uh, with, with very clean white walls. And it was actually nicer than most of the clinics I've seen in Canada. Um, and I sent those pictures off and almost immediately I got a response from the organization saying, you know, those photos are great, but uh, you're going to have to retake those. They're, they're not really telling the story that we want to tell. They're not, like, they're not Africa enough. And again, that's, that's when I really I struggled with that kind of inside feeling of, like, clearly, this is a symptom of a much bigger problem that I'm, I'm a part of and I'm, I'm creating, uh, and I don't like it. And for me, that lesson of, uh, not only the stories that we tell, but the stories that we omit has been one of the most valuable lessons that I've had, um, especially so running an, an organization called the, the one in Nicaragua. Uh, I have to deal with this every day. So when I try to tell people about the work that I do in Nicaragua, the most common question I get is, is that in the northern or like western part of Africa? And for me, like Nicaragua is in Central America. So the, <laughs> for, <laughs> For me, that, that really shows that the stories that I choose to tell and the stories that I choose to leave out are shaping that person's entire cultural perspective of this entire population. Um, and so it's, it becomes really important when, uh, when we want to reduce harm, just to understand those, those concepts. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think it does get easier with practice. And uh, I think the, the real question is, how do we start challenging ourselves and uh, how do we do less harm? How do we work better to stand in solidarity with the people that we want to serve? Um, and for me, I developed three kind of basic things as takeaways that can really help you uh, to mitigate the harm that you do. So the first one is to own your discomfort. Um, that, those kind of gross feelings that you have inside when something happens that just doesn't really sit right. Uh, instead of running away from it, one of the most useful things I've learned how to do is just run towards it at full speed, um, sometimes for the better. And uh, when I start to ask myself questions around, you know, how am I influencing this? Uh, how can I stop influencing this? Um, that's when I start to understand uh, and leads me to a solution around developing a better way um, where that harm won't happen. Now, another one here is uh, listen and to empathize. So once you understand how you influence that harmful scenario, uh, it's really important to understand how other people listen, uh, how other people influence that harm as well. So uh, that's kind of the idea where I started asking the, the local medical doctor beside me or the, the healthcare professionals that I was working with or other patients. Um, because it's then that we can start to remove our ego from what we're doing enough to actually see the true situation. Right? Does it actually help or does it hurt? And I think that those are really important questions to ask when we swear an oath to do as little harm as possible. And the last one here is to shed your what's. And what that means is uh, essentially what you do is not who you are. And the people that I've seen mix this up, they, they really do blind themselves and they, they end up causing more harm than they think they do. Um, I think we're, we're very complex, right? We, we do a lot of things in our lifetime and, and we definitely do chiropractic very well. Um, but it's important to distinguish that from being a chiropractor uh, and then falling into an identity crisis if anything ever changes. Um, and that's, that's really important because our egos, yeah, there, there's that psychological kind of principle that does blind us to seeing the amount of harm that we do um, in that. So when we shed the what's, when we listen and we empathize and when we own our discomfort, that allows us to move on from failures relatively quickly instead of letting it uh, just kind of take us out for weeks at a time. And more importantly, that lets us shed our successes. And this is where uh, I'm uh, kind of getting my ass kicked right now. But it's when you're successful at something, 
uh, to not let it hold you back from continuing to engage and to learn as much as possible. Um, and then the last part here that I want to leave you with is it's the idea of negotiating. Uh, very rarely have I ever seen a solution that just mitigates all harm or mitigates all risk. But the power of negotiating actually does way more to do that than anything else. Just having the conversations, listening into empath and empathizing with people, that's what's going to help you in the long run. Um, so those are just a couple of stories that, uh, that I had that I wanted to share with you today and uh, some takeaways from that. Uh, thank you very much for your time.